Welcome to Fall Rise Give, a space where we invite you to dig into the real cause of your suffering. Looking at opportunities for growth with a change in your beliefs, thoughts, and actions so you can be your true self and be inspired. Join us as we explore life's ups and downs and navigate the twists and turns, sharing stories of resilience, hope, and the transformative power of giving back. Whether you're looking for a change, in recovery, or simply seeking inspiration, this podcast is your go-to for candid conversations, raw emotions, and a whole lot of heart. Tune in and discover how to fall, rise, and give back on life's extraordinary journey. Welcome to Fall, Rise, Give. Turn struggles into opportunities by being your true self and help others. How are you doing? I'm Bartender Bob, and that, my friend, is Kumar. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Had a great week. How about yourself? You know, excellent. I I actually I know I know I told you in June I did my first wedding, officiating my first wedding. I uh, officiated another one yesterday at sunset on the Mississippi River and it was cool, but buggy. Lots of bugs here. Yeah, we're lucky. We don't have too many in the Pacific Northwest. We just have spiders that start to come out. Spider season starting now. Yeah, we have spiders around here too, and it's crazy how how spidery they are. We were just uh, out having coffee this morning before we started recording this podcast, and there's a big spider crawling in between the LP tank and the gazebo, and the 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 web was huge, and the spider was probably the size of my thumbprint, and Monique wow. did one of the, you know one of these jump back a little bit a little bit afraid. This week we are going to try to tackle the uh, the big one, responsibility. And responsibility is something that we all need to take for our own actions. I know that once I realized that in my life, once I realized that you have to stand up and just say, "Hey, you know what? I'm the one that made this mistake. I'm the one that did this. I'm the one that did that." My life felt a little bit better, you know? And I know that uh, that we have we have a guest this week and it's somebody that uh, that you Kumar know. And why don't you introduce our guest and then we can go from there. Yeah, Emily is a pretty amazing person. Um, Met her through the Attitude Adjustment Program. She's got a very interesting story of falling a bunch of times and rising. And uh, so, yeah, she's very inspiring in a lot of ways. Um, I think people who struggle a lot that overcome them have a great story to tell. And she's a huge fan of the podcast and has been promoting it in across different attitude adjustment channels and friends with our previous guests as well, Maya and uh, Gabe. And so, yeah, I'd love to have have her on the show and uh, talk about our story. Excellent. Emily, welcome to the show. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to do this. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am originally from Indiana, and I've been in Seattle for about four years now. I am intimately familiar with the Attitude Adjustment Program and have come and gone from that program a few times in my life and had several falls um, with the legal system and just getting in trouble because of my drinking. And I just recently celebrated my 36th birthday was on Friday, this Friday, the 13th, I turned 36. (laughs) And six days before that, I celebrated one year of no alcohol. So good for you. I am rising for sure. And just feeling really good and feeling really grateful. You mentioned that so one year, so basically a, a year and a week ago, you stopped drinking, what made you stop drinking? Was that the first time that you stopped drinking? No, that was I, I had several times um, going out and doing a little more research, and I threw out college and after college really struggled with, um, I had several DUIs, and I just couldn't imagine my life without drinking. You know, I couldn't imagine being a young person in America going out, and the culture is just so... Um, it's just so enveloped in our culture to be drinking and the guilt and shame of after you've been drinking the, uh, you know, it, it's just, our culture has made it really funny and silly that you're blacked out drunk or that you don't remember what happened. And I think I really kind of bought into that and didn't realize how many people felt the same as I do, how many people were struggling, how many people wanted to have a better life for themselves and try something different. And I actually went to a women's rehab in 
Seaside, Oregon. Uh, this coming December, it'll be two years ago. And my family had an intervention with me after a couple of my two very best friends from childhood spoke with them and let them know that I was really heading down a, a bad path. And that was actually about two years ago during my birthday. And my friend said she wasn't sure if I would make it to my 36th birthday when I just had my birthday a few days ago. And that's how I felt as well. I honestly never thought that I would make it to 36. I, you know, I just had many years of really deep struggles and really um, getting in with the wrong people and making bad decisions that I um, just, I can't believe that I'm still safe and alive at this point. And then I met my boyfriend, who is my life partner, who I live with now and can't imagine life without. And we drank a little bit at the beginning, but I I had told him that I'd been to rehab and I just was upfront and honest about that at the beginning. And we were kind of casually drinking, but it was never too casual in my mind. And things just came to a head and he is the one who really held me accountable in that moment. and. Um, I came crawling back to the attitude adjustment program and, uh, seeing everybody and the welcome and love and light that they gave me, uh, they say they love you until you are able to love yourself. And that was really true for me. There were a couple of different groups that I went to that really just paved the way for me and showed me that there's a better way of life. And, I really wasn't sure about it, to be honest with you. When I first started and when I went to the rehab, I wasn't, I didn't know that it was an AA based program. Mm -hmm. And that has just been a really beautiful thing. And yeah, I just feel really, really grateful to be here today and to have all the tools of this program and to know that if I don't drink today, my life will be better. So you so you said that you went to a, a, a treatment center two years ago, but you so I'm guessing in that two years you, you mentioned that you you and your boyfriend got together and then you had mm-hmm. some you know you had some cocktails and drinks and whatever. What made you decide after going to going to treatment that time and going to AA and going to you know the the alcohol free life to go back to alcohol? So what what made you go back to alcohol and then what made you come off of alcohol for the for this final hopefully final time? I think I went back to alcohol because I just couldn't imagine my life without alcohol. I really, I think I, I set a solid foundation while I was in rehab and got a lot of tools and saw how my life could be better without alcohol. And then I quickly kind of went down that bad path again and it just felt like everyone was doing it. And I was surrounding myself with people who are not people that I aspire to be like. And, um, you know, I really believe that you're the sum of the five closest people to you. And when I'm surrounding myself with people who are, um, you know, drinking and using drugs and partying all night, then it doesn't seem that extreme for me to be behaving that way. And, um, you know, I, I just... I was at a place where I was going to lose my boyfriend and it was the first solid relationship that I've ever had in my life. And I just knew that if I worked every day to stay sober and to make myself better, then perhaps we would be back together. And if not, I would myself be in a better place to move forward and to, you know, tackle life's problems um, with a more clear head. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just really dove into it and I felt like my, you know, it was time to give myself a solid try and see what I could do without alcohol. So is he a drinker? He drinks like once in a while, but not too often. Does that bother you when he drinks when you're around him? No, actually. (laughs) Um, It's it's super infrequent and he usually drinks when he's with his friends. Um, But then whenever, you know, even if he only has two drinks the next day, I feel like he's visibly more sluggish and not as excited or ready for the day. And so that is kind of a good reminder. 
too. I kind of want to circle back and ask something because I think that a lot of people that aren't familiar with AA and myself included, I mean, I've had conversations, of course, on this show and throughout the thing, but you said, so you failed and then you said that, or not failed, but you slipped. And then you said that you went back to AA and they love you until you're ready to love yourself. So you could fall down many, many times and still they're, they're there to help you back up. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. Everyone in that group has been just so supportive and I feel really blessed to have found um, several good people in my area and uh, through the program that I've connected with that have similar stories. I think something that was really big for me joining the program was realizing that an alcoholic is not like a homeless person with a drinking out of a paper bag, living under a bridge. And if you want to change your relationship with alcohol, this is the place to start. And, you know, just understanding that there are so many other people out there that are fed up with the way that their lives were going while they were drinking and are ready to make that change and showing you how you can make that change and how, just how much better your life can get. I just really have felt reflective in the past few days. Um, You know, last year being six days sober on my birthday, and then this year being a year and six days sober, the difference is just absolutely mind blowing. And how many things, every single thing in my life has changed for the better. And I just Mm -hmm. am in awe of the abundance and the little things, the spiders, actually, I love the spiders. I, I've never (laughs) slowed down to like watch a spider making its web. And now we notice spiders all the time. We, we moved just a couple months ago and I'm in just a beautiful, better neighborhood. And I have an amazing apartment that I um, manage the building that I'm in actually. And I got that job through my restaurant job that I work at now. And yeah, things are just really unfolding for me and working out for me. And I think a lot of that is due to my positive attitude and just being a person of gratitude. You've hit a lot of the words that we've talked about in the past, like gratitude. And, you know, I, I think that's really great. So I wanted to ask you about, well, first of all, I want to ask you about your server's job. Is it is it a restaurant or is it a, a restaurant and bar yeah. or is it? Yeah, I work at a sports bar, actually. Okay, so is that hard for you to deal with that on a daily basis where you're seeing people imbibing and doing things that you used to do or some of the uh, any of those things triggers for you honestly it was at the beginning when I first got out of rehab and I still wasn't sure kind of about my path forward and I was meeting people and they were like what are you doing after work let's go drinking that kind of thing was tough Mm -hmm. for me um now that I have a partner that I love and adore and Um, I actually have kind of been a source of inspiration, I would say, for other people that I work with. Uh, More than half of our staff, I would say, is sober now and doesn't drink at all. And I can't imagine that there's a lot of restaurants where you can find that most of the crew is actually sober. And it'll be funny when sometimes there's a new beer on tap and they'll be like, is that cider really sweet? And I'll be like, I have no idea. And none of the other people are drinking either. So we have to ask one of our regulars to (laughs) give it a try and give me a better description of the the beverage. Right. So Emily, what's your biggest struggle so far? I think something that I've really been trying to focus on, I don't, I don't know that I look at my struggles because I feel like I had so many struggles for such a long time. Like, I think I first got arrested when I was like 16 years old. And that just continued to happen for like the next 12 years, every time I would get close to the end of a legal situation, or just after it, I would get in trouble with the law again. And so it was just a cycle of uh, anxiety and stress that I was putting myself through because I couldn't stop drinking. And I've just really found that giving up drinking has truly been giving up one thing for everything. Mm -hmm. And so something that I, I think that I'm trying to just focus on now more for myself is staying in the present moment and 
realizing that the moment that I'm at right now is all that I have. And that helps me really like quell my, my stress about the future. I'm someone who can really get in my ADHD brain and like be overwhelmed by all of the things that I need to get through and all of the tasks on my list and all of that. And just kind of remembering that I figure it out every time I've figured out and been through every tough time in my life so far. And I'll make it through all of those and to just really try to be in the present moment. And um, yeah, that's, that's really all you have is the present moment. So focus on that. So when you're talking about your struggle and you said, you know, at 16, you started getting in trouble with the law, did you blame the law for your problems or did you, maybe at that time when you were 16 years old, you're like, damn cough. But as you got older and realized that, you know, it wasn't the the cops are doing their jobs. Did did you blame the cops or did you blame yourself or how did you go about pinpointing where, you know, where the problem was coming from? Oh my gosh. I really thought that I was like the most unlucky girl ever. Turns out I'm the luckiest person I can think of. Um, you know, I had a couple DUIs. I've had a couple car accidents, multiple car accidents where I was inches away from no longer being on earth. And so I, but yet I was surrounding myself with people who thought it was funny or also had problems and were also drinking, um, in such a way that they were hindering their lives and their growth. And so looking back now where I'm at now in this, you know, having over a year without alcohol, I am like shocked at my behavior and I cannot believe all the things that I've been through and only being a year out, I haven't totally like dug into all of that past trauma and, um, guilt. But I, you know, I'm just trying to move forward and make every day ahead of me the best day that it can be and know that I'm on this earth for a reason with all of the things that I have been through and the near death experiences and the just scary situations that I put myself in. Mm -hmm. So just feeling really, really grateful about that. I know the attitude adjustment program has the 12 steps. And going through the steps is kind of a big deal to go through that emotional trauma and the guilt and all of that stuff. Has that been helpful at all? Or have you dug into that a little bit? Or um, how has that affected you going through the steps or thinking about the steps? Yeah, so I actually have only been through the first three steps. Um, And I've done that twice now. So I did the first three steps when I went to rehab. And then I did it differently with my sponsor. And um. Yeah, I just haven't quite gotten to tackling step four yet. I think that I'm really in a place of like protecting myself and trying to stay on this like healthy, happy path and um, just really protecting my, my energy and my mind as I'm healing. And I am looking forward to getting to the steps, but I haven't gotten very far yet. I do think though that getting through the first three and having this different relationship with a higher power has been absolutely life-changing and something that I've been focusing on more is just my connection with the universe and a higher power. So that part has been immensely helpful for me so far. How has taken the responsibility of being a, a drinker changed your life? So maybe a, a way to rephrase that is how is how has taking the responsibility of not drinking changed your life? Because I, I I was thinking about it. You know, you were a drinker. You took the responsibility that hey, I am a drinker. I have a problem. I need to go ahead and and fix this. I need to not have any DUIs anymore. I need to not get in accidents. I need to not be that close to getting myself in a, you know, in a, in a fatal rack. I think my responsibility now is, I don't know. I feel a sense of responsibility to my family and the people close to me to kind of live the life that I always could and the life that I deserve. And I, 
I don't know. I feel really lucky to be where I'm at and know that my life would not have been this way um, <clears throat> if there were other people that weren't looking out for me. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I think I'm I'm really just like in a place of looking forward and moving forward and trying to grow and push off from here. So I haven't really honestly dug super deep into that. So we talk a lot about thriving uh, instead of just surviving. It sounds like you've kind of launched yourself into that thriving. And we talk a lot about in the program about reading books. And um, as you know, I read a lot and and, uh, Bob and I talk a lot about reading certain books and um, is there any, any books that stood out or any particular messages that have really made a big impact? And, and I see that you're starting to thrive more, like you said, a new job, uh, you know, managing a building, getting a free apartment, um, surviving, things like that. Uh, so tell us a little more about thriving and then any, any books that have helped you or any particular messages? Yeah. So I would say I, I absolutely do feel like I'm, I'm thriving now and I'm really stepping into, um, a better version of myself. I think it's been really cool to see how I can interact with and um, connect with people while I'm sober. And just thinking that alcohol was, you know, making me more social. I was the fun party girl. I thought that I needed alcohol to talk to people. And so now proving to myself that I'm, I don't need that. And I'm actually a lot more wonderful without it um, has been a wonderful thing. I think a couple books that have really stood out to me recently. Well, when I first got sober, I was really listening to a lot of books about not drinking and how to stop drinking. And I was just, you know, I'm a really um, statistical evidence-based person. And so hearing more about, the effects of alcohol on the brain and those kind of things was something that I was interested in at the beginning. A couple books that I've listened to, I'm a big audiobook person. I have my free library card and I you can download tons of audiobooks on their app. And a couple that stood out to me recently were Wherever You Go, There You Are. Uh, I'm just pulling up my thing. I love The Subtle Art of Not Giving a F- and his books and his podcast. I think those are both really amazing. The Eight Secrets of Powerful Manifestation is a great one. And I, lis- I listen to We Are the Luckiest. That one is also about drinking and just, you know, feeling the gratitude of having been a prior drinker and um, knowing how bad it can get and then being so grateful for how good it is now. Uh, yeah. So those are a few books that have piqued my interest or that I've, I've been using as resources lately. That Mark Manson book, or that's Kumar mentioned that one to me too. And I picked up that book and it, that's, that's a good book. And his, yeah. he's got, he's got a newsletter too, that he, do, that he mails out weekly. So what would you tell your 33 year old self? My 33. Oh man. I would tell my 33-year-old self that if if you can give up alcohol, you can really live a beautiful, blessed life that is beyond your wildest dreams. And yeah, I think I think uh, I I really honestly didn't think that I was going to make it to 36 when I was 33. And looking back right. on what I was doing on my 34th birthday versus what I did a few days ago for my 36th birthday has been really a shocking um, comparison for me mentally. So if you would have had that chance to tell your 33 year old self that would your 33 year old self have believed that you would have been a year, a year sober at 36? No, No, I, I, I really can't believe that I've been a year sober and it's just such an impactful change that I don't look back at all and I feel really, really grateful to be someone who doesn't crave alcohol and to be someone who feels like maybe I still could drink. I really finally feel solid in my foundation and I'm finally 
just feeling like I'm growing and evolving and, you know, I'm just finding such joy in the little things. And like yesterday, I repotted a bunch of plants and just small things that are bringing me such great joy that I never would have even, I mean, I was killing all my plants when I was 33. So (laughs) it's just a, you don't drink alcohol, Emily, they don't like alcohol. Hey, I have a question. I want to ask both of you guys this question. And you, you said, you just said that I can, maybe I can drink, uh, maybe I can have a drink and, and, is that is that a common thread? I mean, is there a lot of people in AA that believe that they could have a drink and be okay? I can just have one and be and be fine. Kumar, you want to answer that first? Yeah, I have a friend who um, did six months, and then, um, as we call it, went out. Um, she said she can have a drink, and that's it for the night. And she said that she rushed in calling herself an alcoholic, uh, that maybe she wasn't a true alcoholic. I think there are certain people who might have a mild problem and think they can just drink one. I think there are certain people, um, I think mine is probably more of a mild to medium size of a problem. And there are people who have hardcore problems, I think, in the sense that, you know, being arrested four times or being gone to jail four times, that may be a little bit harsher. I think it doesn't really matter. I think what really matters is if you think you've got a problem, you've got a problem. And it's not the one drink. It's what it's stopping you from doing. Are you living a life that you want to thrive in? Are you living the life of accountability, personal responsibility, social responsibility to your family and friends? A lot of people in AA that I meet, and obviously I'm a parent and I have children and um, growing up kids, and you know they're obviously grown almost adults now. How much do you want to be there for your kids? And so many people who are parents, I think it's easier to just to kind of drown your sorrows and just living a basic life, and what I call living a numb life. And once you stop drinking, the depressant part of that alcohol starts to go away. And you start to have more joy in little things. You start to live in responsibility and accountability. And I think that's what the program teaches you. Not just so you can have one drink. It's about why were you drinking in the first place? Mm -hmm. What's keeping you away? And there's a great book that I uh, loved out of the program. It's called A New Pair of Glasses. I think I've talked about it before. And he says the biggest difference between drinkers and um, an average person is the drinkers are very unsatisfied with life. They have a disconnection with their higher power or a God. And that's why they drink. And so they're very dissatisfied with life. And so once you start to realize what it is that you are not okay with, you're not going to change it through drinking. Once you take accountability and responsibility for yourself, that's when you start to start thinking about, okay, base is just today I'm not going to drink. Tomorrow I'm just going to not drink. And then from day by day, you start to uncover this layer of what is really going on with me. That's why I think the steps are really important as well. But really, the first step is admitting that you have a problem, holding accountability for yourself. Um, And then once you have accountability, then the things will take care of themselves. The steps will come at their right own time. I've known Mm -hmm. people in the program two to three, four years that have been stuck Mm -hmm. at step four and when they get through it, they're like, oh, it's not a big deal at all. Uh, And so step four is really about accountability is like realizing, okay, what is it that I've screwed up on? What are my, what are my um, dysfunctions or my, um, you know, my character flaws? Why do I get angry? For me, anger and frustration were a lot part of my problem because I couldn't accept things the way they were. I had a hard time with acceptance. I wanted a different outcome. And I was dissatisfied with the current outcome that I was getting. So I want to do things better and better. So the serenity prayer has helped me a lot in the program, holding accountability and really accepting things as they are today so that I can build from that foundation. So that's kind of my long answer to that question. But um, I don't think most alcoholics can drink just one drink. Um, I think you want more and another one, another one. They have an addictive personality. Not everybody has an addictive personality. And ultimately, being in recovery, you realize that your alcoholism was a gift because once you get through it, you're a grateful alcoholic. And so that gratefulness starts to come in. 
So yeah, that's kind of my answer, Bob. Okay. Wow. Do you have a much longer answer than that, Emily? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the thing that I I was thinking when you asked the question was just outside of the the drinking and then the effects afterwards from the drinking, the anxiety and the shame and all of that um, is how much time I spent just mentally thinking of when I could drink, how many drinks I could have, you know, what the timing of like having my first drink was in order to not be completely blacked out by the time the event started or whatever. And just, just freeing up my mind from all of those cycles of, you know, figuring out what I was going to do and drinking more on the days where I didn't have to work the next day because I knew that I could waste the whole day being hungover and all of that, that pattern was just um, really a sad place to be. And so that has also been a huge change, not just the drinking and then the after effects from that, but the pre drinking and um, yeah, just the mental state that you can be in when you completely let go of that. I think right. it's, it's just, I, it, there's no world for me clearly, uh, with the level of addiction that I was at, that I could drink casually and just taking it off the, the plate completely is the way to go for me. And I think a lot of people would probably find it a lot easier to just cut it out completely than to try and rationalize or figure out when you can have one or the next one. Right. That makes sense. I have one final question for you, Emily. Yeah. How do you want to be known? You know, I just really want to be known as a positive person who comes to people with no judgment and is accepting of others and just brings a light and love to a space. I think, you know, I had, I had been serving before I got sober. Uh, I, I'm kind of a, I've been a waitress for a long, long time. And I was feeling not great about, you know, being a waitress at 36 and just not, not where my life I thought was going to be. And I've just realized the impact I can make on people on a daily basis. And if I can just spread love and light and happiness and excitement to other people to just kind of like raise the the vibration of the space that I'm in, then those people go out and raise the energy where they're at and to just try and be a positive, um, understanding person for others. That's excellent. Kumar, have any final thoughts? I think uh, it reminds me of a little story about Mother Teresa, right? She didn't go out to change the world and to be known as this great saint, the sainthood that she finally got from the Catholic Church. She wanted to just do the laundry of the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, right? And she just wanted to raise the energy level or the cleanliness and bring God or the higher power to those kids um, and the lepers in Calcutta. And I think it's the little things that we do that add up to a lot bigger things. We're not trying to change the world. And I think Gandhi said this as well. Like, you know, if you want to change the world, first thing you got to do is change yourself. Have the responsibility, ability to be able to change yourself and who you are. Um, that's kind of where it starts. Once you take accountability for it, um, you become more responsible. But I think it's it stops with not having a drink, right? It starts, sorry, it starts with not having a drink. And for a lot of people who are grateful alcoholics, they do bring a lot of positive light. They do bring love to every single newcomer who joins a meeting. And so there's just such a, such a positive effect out of the program. And uh, there's millions of people in the Attitude Adjustment Program that are bringing light to the world. And uh, it's, it's an amazing journey to be a part of. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Fall Rise Give where we explore stories of resilience, growth, and giving back. If you enjoyed today's episode, please visit our website at www.fallrisegive.com. Also consider subscribing to our podcast on your favorite platform and leaving us a review. Your feedback helps us to continue to bring you inspiring stories. Stay tuned for our next episode, and remember, every fall is a chance to rise, and every rise is an opportunity to give. Until next time, keep falling, rising, and giving. This is Fall Rise Give, produced by PodcastForHire.com. Thank you for listening.